Now it's half past eight and time for this week's Drama on Three. And with Halloween just a few days away, tonight's play is a freely inspired version of a classic vampire film, Nosferatu, a famously frightening silent movie from 1922. The playwright is the poet Amanda Dalton and she's here to introduce her work, The Midnight Cry of the Death Bird. I've always loved film and I think that radio is actually a very visual medium. I think I was inspired by the idea of taking a silent film and trying to find a poetic language almost, a way of telling its story. I think one of the things I've tried to explore in this play is ways in which we communicate and ways in which silence and miscommunication um, inform a lot of the way our lives unfold. I also think that Nosferatu is a film that actually is full of very contemporary concerns. When the film was made, Germany was a, a country of very broken people coming back from World War I. And also the, the country was racked with a massive influenza epidemic. So it's very much a film that came out of a time of fear of invasion um, and fear of disease and death and of, and of really disease being something that we couldn't control. Uh, and I see that as still a very contemporary concern. the closed locket in the no light extinguish light smash a bulb cut a wire static in your television wireless fidelity your sound waves in your sitting room soot reprehensible irresistible oh the deep desire captivating but I am insatiable a hungry ghost to your inner other. My skin is a damp coat. I catch a pestilence from wearing it. Achoo. Achoo. And you have kept me waiting too long. I wait for you. Tick tick. Tick 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 tick. Cock, roach, scuttled in the floor before the switch flicks on. Turn on the dark, I'm afraid of the light. Feel me press on you in the dark, in the creviced dark, when sky and earth are pinned together, needle sharp. Your attic feels me coming and it shudders. Floorboards moan, tap drips, drips in the dark because I'm thirsty. Not for water, not for... Oh me, oh my, so tired, so sad, so melancholic, desperate. So desperately sad. Someone has turned the sound down. Someone has turned the sound down so I won't hear it coming. Like a creep, like a spider in the skirting board. Suddenly there, like the tiny pipistrel bat you found on the curtain. Ellen, look at the curtain. What on earth is that? I, I swear it's a bat. Is this what love is? This boy man who runs at the world, wide-eyed, laughing with life, who holds me like a brother. At the open window, I tease the cat. I dangle wool from a ball. I sew. He ties his floppy bow. Ellen? He's mouthing words and I can't hear a word he's saying. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Someone turned the sound down, so I didn't hear the scratch at the door, the handle turning, didn't hear a click, click, clicking on the wooden floor. Was I at the window, sewing? Was I watching the garden grow? I lift the cat. I hug it tight. You tie your floppy bow. Listen, with your fingers to your throat. Ah... Like so. You feel the noise in your neck, your chest, the 
It's craving something quite unspeakable. Almost desire coming close. So despicable. So pure. And it sounds like... Sounds exactly like... People! I'm here! Thomas! You startled me. Oh, it's only me, my dearest Ellen, dearest dear. A sweet embrace. <laughs> Where have you been? In the garden. What were you doing there? Ask me what I hide behind my back. What do you hide behind your back? A sweet surprise. A sweet... Fresh cut. A cut? For you! A sweet bouquet. <laughs> Thomas! Why have you killed them? The beautiful flowers. Hello, I'm Roger. Welcome to the Midnight Cry of the Death Bird, my homage to the 1922 film Nosferatu, directed by the great F.W. Murnau. It's my favourite film of all time, and I'm delighted to be bringing my version of it to you on the radio. Now, as you may know, Nosferatu is a silent film which obviously wouldn't have worked at all in this medium, so we've got together some very good actors, and there'll be plenty of talking, and I am going to be your audio guide. So... To set the scene, we're in Wisborg, Germany, in 1843. Wisborg, of course, is a fictitious place, so don't try looking it up on the map. There's a church in the foreground. Rooftops, sunshine, high gables, and a, a circular bandstand kind of thing in the square. You can't see any water at the moment, but there is some. Wisborg is a port. So, picture all that, but picture it in black and white, or better still, sepia-tinted. And although Nosferatu is a really well-restored film, it's a little bit fuzzy and juddery. It trembles, shall we say. Trembles and can't hear, as though it's showing us the world is frail. Anyway, on with the story. Young Thomas Hutter and his wife, Ellen, live in Visburg. After the incident with the cut flowers, Thomas leaves for work. He meets an older man on the street, portly, wearing specs. He says, Not so fast, my young friend. No one outruns his destiny. Hmm, <laughs> a bit ominous. This is Professor Bulwer, a Paracelsian. What is a Paracelsian, you ask? <laughs> Simply a follower of Paracelsus, the great medieval physician and alchemist who denounced many of the beliefs of his time. Paracelsus pioneered the use of chemicals and minerals in medicine and developed treatments... Professor Bulwer is employed at the Institute. He gives a lot of lectures. Later in the film, there's a whole scene where we see him demonstrating to his students on the subject of vampirism in plants. Nosferatu! Does this word not sound to you like the midnight cry of the death bird? Take care in saying it, lest life's images fade into shadows and ghostly dreams rise from your heart and nourish themselves on your blood. Knock, knock, knock. Knock, 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 knock. Who's there? Who's there? Knock, the property agent, perched at his high desk. A close-up of symbols on a sheet of paper. Hieroglyphics, cabalistic signs. He seems able to read them, consume them. His mouth's open, tongue up over his top teeth, leering. He calls... Hutter! Hutter! Thomas Hutter works for him. He's at another desk. Books and papers fill the shelves, haphazard, falling. It takes Hutter two attempts to leave his quill in the ink. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming... Sorry, Mr. Knock, I, I'm coming. Uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> now, my friend, Count Orlok, his lordship from Transylvania, desires to acquire a dwelling in our little town. A count? But he must complete the transaction in his home, oh. in his castle. A castle? In Transylvania? Where is that? You could earn a nice purse full of money. I could? Of course. The price is a little effort, some sweat, 
Perhaps a little blood. <laughs> <laughs> what is uh, that paper, those uh, symbols? Is, is that Transylvanian? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Transylvanian. Do you truly not know where it is, Mr. Hutter? Well, this mysterious land? No. You don't, do you? You do not. The map. Look at the map. There. East. Further east. There. Above your finger, there. You have it. Transylvania. Count Orlok needs a fine, deserted house. Deserted? Quite abandoned, possibly. Left to fall into decay. Well, he will rebuild it? Perhaps he will. Perhaps he will not. B but why? He could surely afford a, a beautiful house. He has a taste for broken houses. Show him these houses and uh, this warehouse. If you are certain... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I am certain. Travel quickly. Travel well, my young friend. Into the land of thieves and spectres. <laughs> Hutter has never travelled further than the edge of Visborg, so this is pretty exciting, and I guess he's nervous. He goes home. Ellen sits beside an open window reading in a room full of flowers. Some flowers on the wallpaper, an embroidery of flowers, 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 blooming flowers, fussy. Not my taste at all. In comes Thomas. All in a rush, all at sixes and sevens. Ellen, I'm travelling far, far away into the land of thieves and spectres. Into the what? <laughs> into the where? No, I, I must prepare, cannot delay, I... my hat. Uh, my hat. And your hat is here? Uh, a Count Orlock. Count? Uh, Orlock, he has a castle. Still, he wishes to buy a property in our small town, a property that is derelict. Uh, why? I will travel through the mountains, Ellen. I will shake his hand, I'll, I'll drink with him a glass of the finest port, I will return with money and riches, and I must, I, I must take ink, a fresh ink, and I must find my travelling sack. I read my book, I sew, I lift the cat. You fill your travelling sack. I read your lips, you turn your back. Nock has instructed me to gather the details of all the deserted buildings in our town, the broken down, the derelict, to offer to the Count. I, oh, I, I hope he's not making a fool of me, but, but why should he do that? Why? He tells me that such a property will perfectly serve the Count's requirements. My sweet, what are you looking at? Why are you so afraid? Remember the bird on the lawn? Perfectly unharmed but for its eye picked out. The mirror of its eye, all gone. So I couldn't see myself in it. I couldn't see myself at all. I beg you not to go. I catch my breath, I sigh. I'm trying not to cry. But still already you are leaving. On the street your horse is saddled, watered, fed, and you are distant. There's those grey Carpathian hills. They're actually mountains, the Carpathians. Proper mountains. If she only knew. So, Hutter is leaving. The music you can hear now is the leaving music. And it's clear in the film that Ellen isn't upset just because he's going away. She's afraid. She's having a kind of premonition. She knows something is wrong, she just doesn't know what it is. She says nothing. Hutter, of course, is oblivious, so he goes, leaving her in the care of friends. The ship owner, Harding, and Harding's sister, Ruth. Be at ease. That's Harding. He says things like that. Be at ease. Sweet Ellen, be at ease. You will be safe with us. And that's Ruth. She's a minor character. She will never leave our sight. We shall read together, so the time will pass. I, I will write. Farewell. There is no escape left. Oh, my dearest dear. Ellen. Thomas, be gone. We will keep her safe. Thomas, you do not understand. I do not understand, but... Oh, my dear. My dear. 
cutter travels many dusty roads. The terrain becomes more difficult for the horses, but at last, the glowering peaks of the Carpathians rise before him. Thin trees strain tall, reaching for the sun. And then, what's this? A port in a storm, an inn with courthouse and stables. Smallpox, typhus, measles, influenza, legionnaire's disease. I am making a list. A shopping list. Yellow fever, cholera, SARS, tuberculosis, AIDS. A big shop. A supermarket shop. Malaria, avian influenza. Good evening. Una sial. Bene. Bene. I venit. The innkeeper meets them with good cheer. The horses are unharnessed. Hutter is welcomed inside. Viaggio. Stagios. Una massa. Pentru aspettele nostro. Someone brings him a drink. He's wildly cheerful, probably with anxiety. Downs his drink in one. Oh. <laughs> Another flagon of wine. Bangs the table, wanting more. <laughs> In the film, the locals are wearing some lovely peasant outfits, embroidered shirts and waistcoats, pennies. It's a shame it's not in colour. They've gone to a lot of trouble. <laughs> Quickly, something to eat. I, I need food in a hurry. I've got to get to Count Orlock's castle. Yes, Count Orlock. You know him. He is uh, important, yes? Famous in these parts. <laughs> În umbra unui monument, în macabrul loc dintre lumi, unde vrăcolacul urlă, unde moții se ridică, la căderea soarelui, la răsetul nopții negre, negre. Break of nothing on the border of the world, in the shadow of the grave, in the deadly space between. You must not go any further, in the dark. You must not go. The werewolf roams the woods. It shifts its shape. It's much too late. You should go home. It's far, too far. It's coming near. Stay here, stay here. Don't speak of it. Extraordinary teeth. It takes your blood. It flees. It spreads disease. Don't say a word. You must stay here the night. You must wait here until it's light. All right. I'll stay. I'll stay. I will stay one night. A dog-like creature makes its way down the hill in a blue, distorted light. It's a sloping, twisted thing. Just a hyena, that poor, vilified animal said to steal spirits, rob graves, take children. Certainly, it has a ferocious bite. The horses are in the field. They panic, bolt. The scene fades. The of Athens, of Imos, Hong Kong flu, the Haiti cholera outbreak, Russian plague of 1770, the Great Plague of Seville, the AIDS pandemic, Black Death, Chingunguya virus. Keep wax, burning light, bed clean, herb fresh air, uh, water to wash, no piss out window. Door shut tight. Thank you. You are kind. Oh. Good night. Yeah. Hutter is restless. From his bedroom window, he sees the horses startled, bolting in the field. And there is the creature, close up. Hyena, werewolf. Below him in the yard, the peasants mutter. They're afraid. They cross themselves. Hutter roams the room, finds a book, and it's certainly not the Gideon Bible. Of vampires, ghastly spirits, bewitchments, and the seven deadly sins. From Belial's seed sprang the vampire Nosferatu, who both live and feed on the blood of humankind. 
Beyond deliverance he doth dwell in ghastly caves, sepulchres, and coffins, filled so with God-cursed earth from the fields of the black death, on the brink of nothing, on the border of the world, in the shadow of a grave, in the deadly space between, where the werewolf roams, where the undead rise, at the falling of the sun, at the rising of the black, black night. Thomas? Thomas? I cannot see you, cannot imagine you. My dreams are filled with suffering. What if... What if I let it in? Oh, I'm spooking myself a bit here. And we haven't met Count Orlock yet. I think I'll take a short break, make a cup of tea, during which we can look in on Professor Bulwer at the Institute. Here he is. And it is recorded that in 1534, in the plague of Sturzen, <laughs> he administered orally a pill made of bread <laughs> containing a minute amount of the patient's excreta that had been removed from the rectum on a needle point, and that, indeed, the patient was cured. Paracelsus, my children, understood that all things are poisoned. Nothing is without poison, but, 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 but in small doses, what makes one ill can also cure. And so, what of poisonous vapour? Of the belief that foreign vapours swallowed with the air brought plague to our country? In the kitchenette, Roger makes a pot of tea, whistle, whistle down the wind while he works through the barren trees in the night. Sounds like someone's crying out there, moaning around the building. Let me in. It's me. Into the steamy kitchen. Open the window. That's right, Roger, Roger, open wide. Sniff, sniff. There's something in the steam, but he can't smell it. Something vaporous and p -p poisonous. Breathe it, breathe it in. No, oh. There's too much water in the kettle. Overflowing, splashing, boiling, boiling, scald your... Ow, dumb kettle! Ah, ow, 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 Too late to oh, make it better. Oh. Much, 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 much too late. You let me in, invited me in the dark, in the no, no light. Extinguish light. Smash a bulb, trip a switch, cut a wire, cut a wire. Shit, it's dark. Soph! So are you upstairs? The kettle just... I think I blew the kettle up, fused the lights. Sophie! I can make a cup slide from the worktop in the crevice dark when sky and earth are pinned together, needle sharp. Watch. Shit. Oh. He lights a candle with his scalded hand, a tiny flame, a disturbing light. It's hard to tell the time of day or night. Careless boy, careless might. Shimmering light and dark, dark black and white. The kitchen shudders, frail kitchenette, fitful light. Dumb. Out. Nighty-night. Hello? Hello? No idea if you're still there. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm in the dark. Uh, um, I, I, I won't bore you with what just happened, but... Well, on we go. Music. Hutter sleeps surprisingly well in his room at the inn. He wakes to a bright morning, stretches, smiles, leaps out of bed... The horses are frolicking in the field. All is well with the world. He picks up the book. Of vampires, ghastly spirits, bewitchments and the seven deadly sins. He laughs at it, throws it onto the floor. Off with the top half of his nightshirt, Natalie tying the arms round his waist. A good cold wash in the basin and he's ready to go. Out in the yard, the men prepare the coach and horses and they're off. The mountains darken. 
shift in the lengthening shadows. The sun is going down. Hurry! Onward! The sun is going down. The sun is going down. We are nearing the bridge. You must go further. It is not yet night. It's much too late. It's far too far. We are not further. We'll not wait. There is terror has broke loose. Across the wide, wide, wide world. I demand. I, I will give Open you a... many things. Not beyond the pass. No, no to cross the bridge. <laughs> All right. I shall walk. I'll walk. As soon as he steps across the bridge, eerie visions seize hold of him. He has traversed an invisible border, crossed the line. Distorted rock, the edge of a castle up high. On the roadside, a shrine. He walks. But something is coming. Very fast, double speed. White trees in a dark fog. White wood, white wood. Topsy-turvy, world's got scurvy. Quadruple speed, impossible speed, everything in negative. The trees are white limbs flailing. Nature is bleached out, sucked dry. Black to white and back to black of scarab, crow and filthy. It's a coach coming. Two horses masked and draped in dark cloth so their eyes are dead holes on the coachman. Paint the carriage white to make it black. Turtle, turtle, slow as a don't be. The coachman is... In. Get in. Do, 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 get in. It's... Oh. It's... Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> Go on. Oh, I think I'm going down with a cold or something. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. The coachman is horrible. It's horrible to look at it. It's a terrible, pointed face, eyes ringed with sooty black and the, the whites of his eyes. He looks ill. He's also a little ridiculous. He's wearing this hat, I imagine it green, sort of William Tell felt thing with a couple of feathers in the top. <laughs> anyway. Do get in. Hutter gets in, and we hurtle away at that abnormal clockwork speed. White trees in a dark fog. White wood, white wood. At abnormal speed. Topsy turvy, world's got scurvy, black to white and back to black. At abnormal speed. Of scarab, crow and filthy cat. At abnormal speed. Paint the carriage white to make it black. At abnormal speed. At abnormal speed. At abnormal speed. Abnormal speed. Abnormal speed. Abnormal speed. How easy it is to mess with him. Poor Roger Bodger cannot see me, cannot hear me, doesn't know I'm in. His head, his house, his microphone, his radio, his system. Horses and coach pull up, and we've arrived at the castle. Hutter slings his sack across his shoulder. The carriage leaves. He's alone. As if by magic, the arched castle doors open like wings. He hesitates goes through. It's you! At you. At you. Oh. Arches. Stone layers. Shades of night. The vaulted passageways are so cold. Shivery, shivering. Legionella pneumophilia. And there was such a fear of pestilence and plague. Who let this foreign body in? Who let it in? Ah, look! Such a cold castle. Who's there? 
This must be the Count waiting to greet his guest. It's the coachman. So the coachman was Count Orlok. But how can this be? Well, this is impossible. He's only just driven away. This is impossible. Mincy, mincy, mincing. He's going nearer. Closer to you. Closer. Behind Hutter, the doors shut. <coughs> Meet your host, Hutter. Meet your host. Doff your hat. Yes, 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 yes. This, this is when he is says... when Count Orlok says... You have kept me waiting. Waiting too long. Now it is nearly midnight. The servants are sleeping. He has a bunch of keys in his clasped, clasped hands. hands. Keys to the castle, keys to the coal hall, keys to the crypt. On. Keys like fingers, much too long, too thin. He's thin, 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 thin as a snake. Hutter follows him down a tunnel, a dark tunnel. Go on. Go on, Hutter. Something has tilted the world, has overturned the natural order. Back to front I stumble, dizzy, walk through sleep and slump all day. I'm heavy-lidded. I wait for word of you. I sow your name, nurse the cat, and I'm glad of that. But I am full of sound, my dear. My throat vibrates. My tired heart drips. My blood is lunatic. Although the description of the instrument may sound a little complicated, its use is, I assure you, entirely straightforward. The gravitator. Undeniably effective in circumstances where there is little or no <coughs> hope for the patient unless... Blood can be important. <coughs> See here on diagram 4B how the blood is transmitted in a regulated stream from one individual to another, like so. A simple venous section is performed on the individual who emits the blood as depicted in 4C. A note of caution. Once the transfusion is underway, one must be sure to observe with unwavering attention the countenance of the patient to thus guard against an overcharge of the heart. Concerns for the donor. She died. How blood is altered in disease. And now, gentlemen, the common leech, Herodou Medicinal. This is nothing. Wait, 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 wait! Patient, gentlemen, and you may learn. Allow me to warm to my theme. Observe. Mm. Uh, such a feast, Count Orlach. Mm. So kind. <laughs> Can you not be tempted to uh, to eat with me? Mm? No. Well, may I cut some bread? Oh, my word, it is so early, so late. Oh. How foolish of me. Oh. Ah, you have hurt yourself. Uh, no, no, a, a tiny cut, a, a scratch. Allow me to assist you. Uh, no, I, I, I mean to say it's nothing uh, to concern. I am... Uh, Precious blood. Uh, only a little. I am clumsy. Tired. Shouldn't we like to sit together a little, dear friend? It is a while till sunrise, and in the daytime I sleep, the deepest sleep. I... Take a seat. Thank you. I... I will. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, where are we up to? Um... Uh, OK, so Hutter backs into a chair by the fireplace and it looks as though Count Orlok is going to sit with him. Oh, Hutter's pretty freaked out. Uh, should have said, the paper that Count Orlok was reading at the table uh, is it, covered in the same symbols and signs that Nott was reading back in the office in Visborg. You might be interested to know that Alvin Grau, who did the art direction for the film, and Henrik Galeen, who wrote the screenplay, were both occultists. 
and these signs and symbols, encrypted letters and such, were apparently inspired by the maths of magic and possibly by chords in the Rosicrucian system. I am sitting on the sofa beside you. Can't see a thing, can you, Roger, Roger, my lodger? Didn't hear me coming like a creep, like a spider in the skirting, like us. Let me feel your... <sighs> Ooh, boy, felt like something touching me. <laughs> oh, whoa, it blew in my face, I swear. Hello? Is there something there? Whoopsie. Oh, my God. My books. There's a pile of books on the table and all my research and my books about the film and vampires and... They just fell on their own. No! Feels awfully fluey, swollen, glandy, shiver burny. Oh. Low blood count. Very low blood count. Not at all good, Roger. Not, not at all. I'm sorry, I, th I think I... Doctor, doctor, is there a doctor out there? Are you a doctor? You in your Peugeot estate? And you in your sitting room? <laughs> Oops, a daisy, down he goes. Hello, welcome back. I'm your audio guide. Welcome to my homage to Nosferatu. I'm going to be talking you through the next 60 minutes or so. So, the midnight cry of the death bird, with a twist, with a different kind of end. Our hero Hutter wakes in the chair, stretches and yawns. His cut finger is sore, and so is his neck. He looks in a mirror, his neck. There are two small marks, but he is not alarmed by them. Fresh food is on the table, and he is a greedy pig. He laughs, he tucks in, he gorges. There is no one about. Outside, the warming sun is on his face. He writes a letter to his wifey. Q. Birdsong. My dear Ellen, my dearest dear, grieve not that thy beloved is so far away. Oh, I am plagued by mosquitoes, I already have two bites on my throat, one quite near the other on each side. <laughs> Most strange. <laughs> but uh, I digress. I have arrived at the castle, and what a desolate place this is. And what a creature is the Count. So alarming to behold, and yet so timid and so pale, so thin... He keeps such late hours, I hardly slept last night. And then such dreams did plague my sleep that I can hardly separate imagining from memory. But fear not, my dear. Today I plan to secure an arrangement with the Count. Travel quickly. Travel well, my young friend. Into the land of thieves and spectres. <laughs> Mr. Knock? <laughs> Mr. Knock! Uh, do, do not be startled. It is only I, Professor Bulwark. Come, come. You are standing in the middle of the road. Professor, how kind. Uh, if a horse, a, a carriage were to come at any speed, come. Can you smell the air, Professor? Can you smell something good is coming? It is coming to me. Will you let me walk <laughs> beside you, Mr. Knock? Take you home? Come, come. I, f I fear you're overtired. Your assistant is away, is he not? You've been working too hard. No, 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 no. My work is going well, Professor. I am securing a purchase on a most unusual property for a precious friend. A most extraordinary friend. He is coming to me. <laughs> Oh, 
Warlock. Warlock. It is time to wake. Sleepy bones, lazy head. Your guest is waiting. It is night. I... There is papers to be signed. When will it be time? A prize awaits. Not him. Not him, silly. I ache. Soon you will taste the sea. In his tears. Not in tears. I cannot swim. What tastes of the ocean? Do not torment me. I ache for... Get up then, you white-headed fiend, you spidery creep. There is pestilence to spread. No time for sleep. And these, uh, these are the properties that may be suitable, that uh, you may wish to consider. Uh, Mr. Nock, Mr. Nock suggested that uh, you may be interested to purchase a property that is not entirely in good order. Uh, that you, uh, oh. uh, And this, um, this uh, pretty, pretty picture. Oh, I'm sorry, it uh, fell from my bag. It is not... Uh, it is your sister. It is my wife. You have lifted the tiny picture from the wall behind our bedroom chair, left a perfect circle of light, as if, despite the dark, a sun shines there. I should be glad. You carry me, you hold me near. But look again. It is an absence, not a light. It is a kind of stain. Your wife. He is transfixed with desire. You want her, you want her, don't you? Want in ways this boy man would not imagine, could not dare. She will cure your ache, oh, your mouth on her flesh. Say it, your wife. Your wife? Has a lovely neck. Your wife has a lovely neck. So very lovely. A beautiful wife. All right, enough. Th this building. Oh. This building sounds... Well, I doubt. Uh, uh, Mr. Nock, he, he put this information in. He thought... A la large... It is a warehouse, uh, abandoned many years ago. I, I know it well, for it is opposite my home. I, I do not know a living soul who would wish to... This... Purchase warehouse, this fine deserted building that is opposite your home? Yes. I shall purchase this house. All right. I... Uh, of course, uh, as you wish. I do. I do. All right. The quill? So I may sign. Yes. Of course. Of course. Because it looms. Because it leans across the water with its hundred hollow eyes and the wind beats at its doors that open onto broken passageways. Its windows are so many sockets staring blind sometimes. I fancy they are portals to another world. Scratching of the quill, scratch, scratch. Signed, sealed, delivered, she's yours. Ah! No! No! Oh, there, my dear. There's something dragging a life in me. I'm draining away, sleeping into nothing. No, my dear, it's just a dream. You are safe. So, try. Why am I so afraid? What is it I see? No, don't leave your bed, my dear. You'll catch a chill. There's something out there. Just the dark, the warehouse. Perhaps the dog in the shadows? It tucks at my nightgown. It's not in the room with us. There's no dog in here. <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> oh, Ruth. You must think I have mislaid my sanity. Shall I stay with you? I can sleep in the chair. 
just leave the lamp. I shall read a while. I am close by. Good night, my dear. In his castle room, Otter kisses the picture of his wife. Romantic. From his bag, he lifts a book, the book he took from the inn. He stole a book, a sneaky thief. And the book says... At night, this same Nosferatu doth clutch his victim and doth suck like a hellish life potion, its blood. Take heed that his shadow not encumber thee like an incubus with gruesome dreams. That wipes away his silly bitty grin. Is someone there? Is there... Count... Orlock? Open the door and see. Where does it lead? Open the mysterious door. Where does that door... My Orlock. Staring, open-mouthed, his hideous eyes ringed black, his ancient hands... In a room like a crypt. He comes towards me. Slowly, slowly does it. So slow. Like a dream, but not a dream, and always coming closer. Inexorably drawing near. I try to shut the door. I shut the door. I shut it tight. Escape. Escape the window. You can jump. Outside, a deep ravine, rushing water far below the castle wall, a sudden drop of fall. Your coat hangs on a high peg like a ghost. I cower on the bed. The handle is turning. Slow. Is it nice and slow? He's there, framed in the arching doorway like a corpse in a coffin. That's good. That's well observed. That is deliberate. I hide beneath the covers like a child. Like, like, you are a child. Child. And at the same hour, in the same millisecond, in Visborg. There is Ellen. Ellen is in the bed. Oh, go to sleep, Roger, go to sleep. Roger is not in Visborg. Roger is in hospital. His immune system is mistakenly attacking his healthy blood. Poor cells, let them rest. Stop narrating, Roger. There's a green light. Ellen sits up, eyes wide. Harding, in his smoking jacket, is in the next room at his desk. It's a former world, a safe world, a gentleman's room. He doesn't hear Ellen. She sleepwalks from the bed. It's a huge room. French windows opening onto the outside. Neck curtains. Swathed. Floating. Everything's white and floating. Outside, a breeze. The wild world's out there. And she stands on the balustrade, arms out in front. She walks along it, asleep. Is she walking to Count Orlock? Is she... Floating. Everything's white and floating. Ellen, she's sleepwalking. Help me, Bruce. Can you hear me, Jim? We're going to give you some blood. Quickly, call a doctor. You'll be full of beans in no time. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Can you hear? Poor, poor Ellen cannot hear. It's all right, Ellen. You were sleeping. You were walking asleep. I've got to tell the story. This is my story. If I don't tell the story to the end... Try to sleep, Ellen. It's all right. Has to end right. Have to get rid of the pestilence forever. Have to hold on to the story, don't you, Roger? You just rest there. You'll be all right. All in bed, tucked up. 
up for the night. Except for the shadow of Count Orlok over Hutter. Closer and closer, bigger and bigger, the length of those exquisitely clawed fingers, shadowed ears, that white domed head. Thomas! Thomas! She stretches out her arms all in vain. Count Orlok rises. He has had his fill of Thomas Hotter. Hotter is not the one he so desires. <sighs> what is taking him so long? What is wrong? Thomas will soon be home. All the doctors in the land cannot settle her. It is the fog, the inhalation of the fog. The stagnant water, the canal. We could perform a phlebotomy, transfusion, far too high a risk. Caused by her position during sleep. Bad blood. Harmless congestion of the blood. A morbid sadness has invaded her. An excess of yellow bile. A lack of sleep. I walk the balustrade. I walk it in my sleep. I balance like a ballerina, dreaming of an ancient beast. I bite my lip. I bite my gum. Blood on my tongue. I'm all wired up. The tubes attached to me and... Oh. This is the story. With the morning sunlight, Thomas Hutter rises. He looks exhausted and afraid. He clutches his neck, leaves his room to escape the horror of his night. He hurries through the castle chambers, searching, maybe, or looking for a way out. And he finds himself in the crypt. And in there, he sees a wooden box a coffin. He's terrified, but he can't resist a closer look. And there, between the coffin's wooded slats, in the darkest shadow and the lightest light, he sees the head. Eyes wide. Two pointed teeth like a rat. He pulls back, throws open the lid, and yes... The white hands folded in the lap, the clawed fingers, white, white head. Count Orlock, it is he. Hutter cowers on the steps, crawls up them, scuttles like he's become a creature too. Cut, 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 cut to pink light. Hutter is on the floor in his castle room, cowering. There is nothing there, not a thing, silly boy, but he has never been more afraid in his life. And then, outside his window, what is this? This rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat, in the courtyard far below. Count Orlok loading Ooh, coffins loading faster, coffins. faster. One, faster. two, three, four, five, faster. and six. Count loading Orlok faster, coffins. faster. One, loading coffins. Two, one, two, three, four, three, four, five, and six. Five, one, and two, six. three, four. Loading, loading coffins. Five and six. Faster, Orlok. faster. Loading six. Orlok. Six coffins. coffins loaded into a cart. Loaded climbing. Into a cart. Climbing. climbing. Orlok climbs into the last coffin. Pulls the lid across. Safe. And the horses pull their cargo away. Locked in my room, I tear the sheets. I knot them, make a ladder, tie it tight, throw it out down the high wall. Like an insect, like a bat, I cling, I creep. I ache to fall as water falls, but I am weak. Unholy cargo. The horses have reached the river. The coffins are piled on a raft. These raftsmen do not know what unholy, holy cargo they convey. Whoosh! Down the raft.
rabbit river, rabbit ratties ran. Count old block. Are you taking a nap in your coffin? To the docks in your box. To the slippery sea. To his borg. My leg. I must get word to Mr. Knock. We have sold a property to a vile, unnatural beast. Tell the professor how this foul-breathed creature sleeps. And my dear wife. Such a beautiful wife. What tastes her the sea? She is such comfort to me. Are you listening, listeners? Are you still there? <laughs> Making a cup of tea? He was brought yesterday to the hospital. Some farmers help him. They say he must help Phil in the mountains. He has a fever. Mm -hmm. Coffins. Beware the coffins. He's delirious. He may be suffering from the inhalation of the fog. Excess of bile. Bad blood. May you perform a phlebotomy, doctor? It's much too large a risk. A transfusion? He's exhausted. Watch him closely. Let him sleep. Tell my wife. Shh, you must rest. Shh, be still. It is the night. You are foreign cargo, Orlok. You must not be seen. I need to move. I... Until you are at sea. I am at sea. The river will take you there. I taste her. Reach for her. She wakes. Concentrate, my little flea. I carry you. You carry me. She is be beautiful. She is not the purpose. She is just the prize. Say after me. Leptospirosis, Yersinia pestis, Toxoplasmosis. The Empusia! Load her up! It's a night. It's a sail in an hour. Cargo, six crates of air. Crates of air? What's, what's the point in crates of air? Help me lift. What is the point in crates of air? Experimental purposes. Perhaps they'd like to experiment with lifting them. Roots, gallops to Frisborg. Now, what, what are you doing? Taking the lid off. Check it. Oh, like coffins. Where's like a corpse, that's for sure. Just load them, will you? Oh, rats! Oh, oh. They're full of bloody rats! Rats! Scourge in your basement, in your attic, in the sewer, in the alley, underneath your floorboards, running along your washing line as bold as brass, swinging from those dinky little feeders you put out for the winter birds. Vermin, beat them out, beat them out, poison them. They didn't know it then, they didn't know it was the rats that had the fleas that bit the sailors and the peasants and the... Rent kill, rent kill. I'm phoning them. I'm phoning. Hello. Thank you for calling rent kill If you are calling to report an infestation of cockroaches, please press 1. If your inquiry is concerning rodents underneath your floorboards, please press 2. Hello, hello. Is that rent kill I'd like to report the plague. I should like to demonstrate to you today the cruel habits of carnivorous plants. <laughs> No, do not look so horrified, dear gentlemen. Nature surely works in ruthless and mysterious ways. Everywhere there are living things that survive by devouring others. It certainly does. Plant be quiet. I cannot see the professor. You're, you're shocked. There's no this plant in my brain. Observe the plant. A Venus flytrap. When stimulated by its prey, it will snap shut. And, remarkably, it can distinguish between living and non-living prey. See how selectively it will trap and feed. A piece of paper. No. Now, observe a fly. <laughs> Good. Good. You are impressed. Now, another carnivore. This one here. A polyp. With tentacles, it extends to pierce and poison its living prey. Always at night. See how it moves. Transparent. 
almost incorporeal, <clears throat> almost but a phantom. That's a bulwark. Huh? I'm sorry to disturb you. The patient admitted yesterday, Mr. Nock, the estate agent, he, he has become most disturbed, mm. agitated, and his doctor is nowhere to be found. Blood is life. Blood is life. Mr. Nock, <clears throat> please do not eat the flies. How extraordinary that he is eating flies. Just now, as I was lecturing. No, Mr. Nock, stop that. You must not eat the flies. They will nourish him. They will give him life. Blood is life. He has separated from himself. Instead of me, he speaks of he. <laughs> How fascinating. No, no, Mr. Nock, their blood is bad. It can only bring disease to you. Spiders. Spiders also, although spiders are in fact... Where the wall and the ceiling meet, up there. Who let them in? I, I do not know who let them in. They are miraculous creatures, are they not, Mr. Nock? See how they spin their webs, cocoon their prey. <laughs> Restrain him, Mr. Nock. There was no need to injure me. Miraculous creature. I feed myself so that when he comes to me, he comes to me. She's in the grip of some unreal imagining. He's insane. Secure him. Cocoon me in silk. Wrap me up tight. Bite, bite. Blood is life. I sit among the crosses in the sand, the modest graves of those who did return but could not stay. I sit among the crosses and I wait, scan the line where water meets the sky. I cannot pray. Some say the ocean swell and ebb is like a lullaby. I feel the tug of it, and in my sleep I walk the balustrade, balanced like a ballerina, dream an ancient beast. I bite my lip, lick my gum, blood on my tongue. A letter! Oh, dear Ellen, a letter has come for you. It is in Thomas's hand. Please read it. Will you not? It is from your husband. Please, Ruth, I... I dare not. Oh, take heart, my dear. He will soon be home. I dare not read what he must say. Please, Ruth. I will open it, and we can read together. My dear Ellen, my dearest dear, grieve not that thy beloved is so far away. I am plagued by mosquitoes. I already have two bites on my throat, one quite near the other on each side. Most strange. Oh, but I digress. I have arrived at the castle, and what a desolate place this is, and what a creature is the Count. So alarming to behold, and yet so timid, and so pale, so thin. He keeps such late hours I hardly slept last night, and then such dreams did plague my sleep that I can hardly separate imagining from memory. But fear not, my dear. Today I plan to secure an arrangement... I must with go. Him. I cannot stay here. I must... Go home. Mr. Hutter, lie down, please. No! You are not strong enough to travel. By the shortest route. G get me a carriage. The horses. I must leave. Who comes by sea? Who comes by land? Ellen, what is it, my dear? Who am I waiting for? In his cell, the estate agent Nock. Far too ill for this, far too weak. The estate agent Nock reads a newspaper. Plague. A plague epidemic has broken out in Transylvania and the Black Sea ports of Varna and Galatz. All victims exhibit the same peculiar stigmata on the neck, the origin of which still puzzles the doctors. The Dardanelles have been closed to all ships suspected of carrying the plague. Sailors fallen ill below deck. He's delirious. Last man down. Aboard the Impuser, disease spreads like an epidemic. The first stricken sailor pulls the entire crew after him into the dark grave of the waves. In the light of the sinking sun, 
I'm going down below. If I'm not back up in ten minutes... The ship's mate hacks into the coffins with an axe. Rats run everywhere. That coffin lid rises as if on its own. Stiff as a board, Count Orlock rises up to face us. His white hands. Impossibly long prehistoric fingers. Sut! High up! Above, on deck, the captain is at the wheel. The ship's mate throws himself overboard. The captain lashes himself to the wheel. Then an extraordinary camera angle. We look up at Count Orlock as if from below deck. He's framed by the ship's rigging. Those ridiculous ears. He should be funny, but he isn't. It's terrifying. The camera cuts between him and the captain, who's oblivious. Then the captain sees him. Like this? The captain see him like this? Eh, hey, Roger? <gasps> What's that? What in God's name is that? It's all right. There's nothing there. There. By the window. God, it's vile. What is it? Roger, Roger. That's no way to greet your visitors. Roger, Roger. Crash call. Start CPR. Call the code. Bye-bye. We're all at sea, all at sea, whose deadly breath fills the sails of the ship, speeding to its destination. We're losing him. The ship of death has acquired its new captain. Oh, and Roger is dead. Something is pushing against the windows, like a wind. It tries to open them. The master is near. The master is near. By the shortest route, I must hurry home. I am in my sleep. Stretch out these thin, pale arms to you. I reach the air. I take a step or two. I walk. Ellen! Come back inside. A swarm of you. I'm overrun. What taste of the ocean? Blood on my tongue. Full speed ahead. Grey seas. High tide. His deadly breath spreads out the sails. He comes to me. Please, I beg you, drive the horses harder. I take a stool. Stand it on my bed. Pull up by the window bars. Oh, my tired arms... See the harbour water still as a pool, but something staring in it. See it tremble. Feel him coming. A sound vibrates in me. It buzzes like a fly caught in my throat. A swarm of flies. The axle snapped. I'll walk. I'll run. I'm coming. A swarm of filthy flies. Pictures on the wall of you, my count. I drew them with a pin. They made you real. They make you come to me. I smell you on the air of this foolish town. You come to me. My heavy bed. I take it up my heavy bed and walk. Smell the air of this empty town. This way, that way, this... Or luck, my friend. What? 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 Get it out of your system, will you? Go to her, get it over with. Then perhaps you will concentrate. Such 
desire. She waits. This way. That way. Oh, I... This way, past the church. I come. I come. Oh, they've come off the ship! They're everywhere! Beautiful skittering rats. rat a tat Smallpox, typhus, measles, influenza, legionnaire disease, yellow fever, cholera, SARS, tuberculosis, AIDS, malaria, avian influenza. Now, Mr. Nock, it's time to eat. Oh, get off me! Oh, my neck! Ha! Bastard! You bit my neck! Help! I am free! I come! I come! And where's the crew? Not a soul has come ashore! Set the gangplank! Get aboard! It sailed itself! The captain? Dead at the helm! Tied to the wheel! Look at his neck! Fetch your surgeon! Too late for that! I'll search below! There's not another soul on board! Strange cargo! Soil and more rats. I'm away from here. We must carry the body ashore. Then help. Vampires. I heard it said vampires can only draw their shadowy strength from the soil in which they were buried. Shh. <laughs> Ellen. Ellen, I'm home. <laughs> Thank God you're safe. All will be well now. I have such stories, but I must hurry to Mr. Nock and Bulwer. I have to tell them. The Count, the Count is... Thomas? Do not look so afraid, my sweet. All will be well. All's well. All is well. Shop of lovely landscape, lovely music. Fields of flowers, bunny rabbits scampering as sturdy farm boys gather hay. Hutter and his dear wife wander hand in hand through the meadow. Lovely music, lovely, lovely. Slow fade, credits. Okay, off the sofa, up you get. Pour another glass of wine or maybe a cup of oval tea if you like an early Sunday night. It's the end. The end. The log. I found the captain's log. Not the end. Varna, 12th July. Crew, minus myself as captain. One helmsman, one ship's mate, five sailors. Oh. Go on. Second day, 13th July. One sailor, ill, with fever. Course, south-southwest. Wind, northeasterly. Fever. I told you, there's fever on board. All going on to my wife. There's pestilence. I can smell it in the air. I must go to Professor Bulwer. Go to your homes. Go, now. I ferry my bed across the thin canal to the deserted warehouse. How it looms. Because it's sad. Because it's empty. And it's broken and the wind always... Catches at its doors. Because the windows are so many hollow sockets. And they stare out, blind. Third day, 14th July. Ship's mate is babbling. Claims strange passenger is below deck. Course, southeast. Wind northeasterly. Men look worried. Read on. Turn to the final pages. Tenth day, 22nd July. Rats in ship's hold. Danger of plague. What do we do? Professor, I'm... I'm afraid. You go home. We all go home. Shut all windows and doors. It is hereby decreed that the Honourable Magistrate of this town forbids the populace to transport the ill or plague-stricken to hospital, lest the plague spread through the streets. Remember the bird on the lawn? Perfectly unharmed, 
but for its eye pecked out, the mirror of its eye, not one breath of life in it. Give me the book. Ellen, I touch the book. I shape the words with my teeth and tongue. I mouth them, ow, yow, like that. I should have left the book behind. Give me the book. I read his lips. He takes the book. I watch him place it back into his travelling sack. Push it underneath the crisp white sheets in the second drawer. Now, rest. We both need sleep. I dream the book. I wake. I creep. She creeps. She slides the drawer. She reads. Doth clutch his victim and doth suck like hellish life potion its blood. Do not read. Take heed that his shadow not encumber thee like an incubus with gruesome dreams. I cannot stop. Stop! Stop! Wherefore, no other salvation is possible but that a maiden, wholly without sin... Which she is not. A maiden without sin. Sin. <gasps> that hotter boy man holds her like a brother. <laughs> Soot. Would give freely of her blood, and so maketh the vampire forget the first crow of the cock. He will disintegrate in the light of dawn. Ellen, my dearest, do not read. Oh, dear. Oh, dearie, dear. A ship of ghosts, a pestilence, a hundred hollow eyes. I put my hand against my breast, a swarm of flies. Come back to sleep. Too late. Too late. Is this my fate? Must I decide? My sweetest dear. Look at the warehouse with its hundred hollow eyes. Through the window where I dangled wool. Tease the cat. My dear, what are you saying? Give freely of her blood. W what are you looking at? The clock. I will. To save the town. I'll hold him to me till the crowing of the cock. Hutter looks at the warehouse with a hundred holes for eyes. She walks away. At last, he's not quick or bright. He cries. No. No. Oh, no. At last. I realize. All around the town, doors are marked with a cross. Another and another. A plague is on your houses. All your houses. Keep your windows and your doors shut tight. Take a paracetamol. Put a handkerchief across your face. Like this. It will not for your speech, Edith, but it may save your life. As if. As if. Fear lurks on every corner of this town. Who can be sure who is still well, who ill? People are dying every hour of every day. How can I lecture? What can I teach? I fear it is too late. I want to speak of contamination, but who will hear me? What can I say? <coughs> Ruth. Ruth, I I'll fetch the doctor. I I'll fetch him now. No, don't leave me. Stay a while. Ugh, <coughs> disgust. Harding sister Ruth is sick as a dog. Mr. Nock, he has lost his mind, was locked away, he has escaped. The darkness of the world runs free. Some say he carries the pestilence about him. Some say he bought it here, but Ellen, I know it is I. Doctor, come please, my sister. They are carrying a line of coffins down the middle of the street. Look, Harding, two by two, carried high. They are come towards us. One, two, three, four.
four, five. I watch them from the high window. Watch the dead in their coffins. Come to me. Captain, Captain quick! It's knocked! He ran up there! He strangled the custodian! The vampire! Is it him? It's him! The roof! He's on the roof! The roof. No, stone, stone him! him. Stone him! 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 Stone he can't help it. Ich liebe dich. Dear Ellen, with her bulky tapestry frame embroidering, I love you. I love you. And we're back to knock. Let's have some music for the chase. Yes. Into the countryside. Take a picnic. Maybe not. A stump of tree. There's a scarecrow. Scarecrow. Ah, oh, an effigy. Or is it knock? Is it knock in the field still stock? They charge at it. They throw it in the air. They break its limbs. It's knock. It's knock. It's not. It's made of sticks and cloth. They run on the waving torn off scarecrow limbs like flags. Would have done the same if it was a man alive. How very sweet is the human mob. How civilized. I am inside. My dank and silent warehouse home. At a window, am its plucked out eyes. See me, Ellen. See me stare. I grip these bars... Am prisoner unless you open your window. I wake with a start, sit up in the bed. I hold my heart. I sleep in the chair. I dream a dreamless sleep. I c- grasp the air. My prehistoric hands reach out. I go to the window. Cannot open my eyes. My husband in the chair asleep. I will him sleep. I see her. She is there. Beyond the glass. I reach for her on the brink of nothing. I must open... My eyes will not open. ...the window. It is time to sacrifice. A chill draft from the world beyond... My life. He comes. I c- c- come, convulsive in a rush across the street. Thomas. Thomas. Sweet. My sweet, you're faint. I tell the lie in silence. I am faint. I am not faint. Let me lift you. Fetch the doctor. Go for Bulwer. Dearest, no, I will not leave you. Go. I beg him, go. I catch my breath. I sigh. I'm trying not to cry. I'll I'll close the window. No! It is the middle of the night. I'll bolt the door. It will not matter. Go! My dearest dear. I'll run. I'll beat the dark. I'll, I'll bring the dawn. Is it he or his shadow climbs your stairs? Is he substance? Is he unattended the shade? He c- climbs to you. You wait. He elongates. Professor! Wake up! Come quickly! Ellen, Ellen is... I'm coming, dear boy. Coming. Knock is captured. Not that he is in any way a threat to this town, but the baying hounds must be modified. Please, hurry. It is my wife. She has a fever. Vomit. She opens the window, yet her skin is cold. She is pale and faint, and yet her heart beats hard. Her eyes are wide, although she doesn't sleep. Take me to her, Hutter. Oh, that we may all find sleep. 
Is it I or my shadow climbs your stairs? Am I substance? Am I unattended shade? I c c climb to you. You wait. I elongate. She is at the window, turned to face the room. Her eyes are wide. Her hand is on her breast. What does she see as she backs toward the bed? Oh, she is brave. And what's this? What's this? What's this? This silhouette against her lily-white nightgown. This creeping, crawling shade. Oh, she looks away, for who could bear to see? We'll watch her face instead. Watch her brave, sweet face. But there's the shadow of his prehistoric hand. It climbs her gown. Insidious, inexorable. Oh, closes on her breast, clutches at her heart, presses on you in the dark, presses on you in the c -c creviced dark, when sky and earth are pinned together, needle sharp. Your skin is a damp coat. I have w w waited for you. You have waited for me. I'm overrun. I bite my lip. I bite my gum. Blood on my tongue. Look, too late, much, 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 much too late. Dawn breaks, he sleeps across her neck. Outside the open window, the broken warehouse looms. He starts, he looks at us, at me. No, it isn't night, yes, it is light. My but beautiful, blinded, burning light. Master, why have you not come to me? Professor, can we walk a little faster? This air is foul. I do not have the breath. He does not have the breath. Orlok stands, clutches his heart. His heart? He has a heart that no. Surely no, clutches his chest, raises a prehistoric hand to block the light. My beautiful, blinded, burning light. The master, the master is dead. Damn fool, he is dead. Alan, I have been too long. The professor, his chest is weak. He could not hurry, but he is here. She smiles, a beatific smile. Or is it just the smile of the sated or the nearly dead? No, 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 no. She is brave. She reaches up her lovely arms, white limbs. Sweet Thomas. <sighs> No! My dear! Professor! Quickly! Come! She's gone! She's gone! <laughs> Professor Bulwer wipes his sad old eyes. He is inadequate and much too late and a little overcome. Witness the miracle <coughs> on the heels of truth. <coughs> At that very hour, the great death came to an end. And as if confronted by the victorious radiance of the living sun, 
the shadow of the death bird was dispersed. Yes, gentlemen, at the moment of his death, <coughs> the plague was gone. We have entrusted our brother Roger to God's mercy, and now in preparation for burial we give his body to be cremated. We look for the fullness of the resurrection. For just a moment, as the mourners prayed, the only moving things were a handkerchief and the Nosferatu. I wear my shape as you might wear your clothes, and my body is nothing but a makeshift home, a box, a trench, a designated zone. At the border, they arrested a foreigner who wouldn't speak. Blood on his teeth, he had no tongue. They said he might have been the Nosferatu. There was dying here tonight, a hundred unmarked deaths or more, lined up like soldiers' graves. And if you bet that trouble comes in threes, Ellen, Orlock, Roger, I'm quids in. Then on the news, a girl who couldn't swim climbed over the wire to jump in the lake to drown the Nosferatu. Oh, fat man of the world, do you not feel me pressing down on your chest and spleen? Will you fend me off with your rubber gloves, your disposable mask, your multivitamin? You may liken me to a rat or leech or flee in your house beneath your floorboards on your Persian cat but they are not the Nosferatu there was a jackdaw once trapped in a basement flat no one could see how it got inside so they took a blowtorch to it burned it blacker than its beautiful black they said it was the Nosferatu. Look at the curtain. What on earth is that? I swear it's a bat. In The Midnight Cry of the Death Bird, Amanda Dalton's play inspired by the classic silent film Nosferatu, Roger was played by Roger Morlidge, The Nosferatu by Valerie Cutco, Ellen by Sophie Woolley, and Hutter by Henry DeVass. Count Orlock was played by Malcolm Rayburn, Bulwer by Conrad Nelson, Nock by Terence Mann, and Ruth by Ruth Alexander Rubin. All other parts were played by members of the cast. Romanian advisers were Aida Cooper and Rominata Alexeyev. The music was specially composed and played by Ollie Fox, and sound design was by Steve Brooke. The Midnight Cry of the Death Bird was directed in Salford by Susan Roberts. 
Well, next Sunday night's drama is a live broadcast from Radio 3's Free Thinking Festival in Gateshead. The Torchbearers by Simon Armitage tells the stories of four people whose lives and obsessions come within touching distance of the Olympic flame. That's next week's Drama on 3 at the later time of 9 o'clock next Sunday evening here on BBC Radio 3.